Hey everyone, before I start this podcast, I want to quickly let you know about my new Patreon. For me, this Patreon is an opportunity to do more of what I love while getting a little extra financial help finishing my theology MA and taking care of my family. For you, it means rewards for your patronage, such as early access to podcasts and new book projects I'm working on, all of my books in digital format, a special bi-weekly podcast that will discuss biblical theological issues, as well as analysis of a theologically relevant movie selected for that episode, and the ability to see and discuss with me the work I'm doing completing my MA and book projects along the way. At the highest support tier, you can also get autographed physical copies of my books, a shout-out in the podcasts, and the opportunity to suggest a film for me to discuss in the exclusive Patreon podcast. If you'd like to check it out, and be aware that you can be a supporter for as little as a dollar a month, visit www.patreon.com slash cantusfirmus. You can also click the Patreon link on the sidebar at cantusfirmus.com. That's cantus-firmus.com. Thanks and enjoy the show. Greetings, this is Cody, and you're listening to Cantus Firmus at the Movies. I'm here with, uh, not here actually with Bridget Nelson, but we're on Google Hangouts talking, uh, and we're discussing uh, the 1955 movie The Night of the Hunter, directed by Charles Lawton. Bridget, how are you doing? I'm good. Hello, Cody. We're having a blizzard here, so I may have to, I don't know, go find Mike. He might be out in the back 40, and I have to go tie a rope around myself and go get him. (laughs) That's awesome. Now, uh, I hope you guys get through it okay. Um, you guys are up in Minnesota, right? So it's kind yep. of, you're used to that at this point. You know, yes, I guess we're used to it as as used to it as you can get. Like you wonder every year, why? Why do we live here? But we just keep doing it. You know, I, I live in Ohio, which is not nearly so bad as Minnesota. And I think that every year as well. So yeah. I, <laughs> we, we both yeah. live in gray places, don't we? We kind of live in the... The gray slacks of the world. Yep, correct. So um, before we start talking about the movie, I just kind of wanted to, uh, anyway, you've been on before. So we've talked about you and your background, and um, Mm -hmm. you've been very involved in uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000 as a writer, Mm -hmm. uh, and we're occasionally a featured player, you might say, uh, Mm -hmm. acting on, on the show as well. And you've been also very much involved in Rift Tracks, mm-hmm. um, which is the kind of, uh, um, um, uh, I don't know, stepchild or whatever, Mystery Science Theater 3000. Uh, it, although instead of doing necessarily just like B-movies, it's like audio commentary for sometimes Hollywood pits, uh, as we, yes. well as B. Uh, everything. Kind of everything. Yeah. There's exactly. Um, we've They've even done, um, Mike, Kevin, and Bill have even done Ca- Casablanca. They've done uh, like good movies, Wizard of Oz. They've riffed everything. And that doesn't mean you riff it because you think it's bad. You just riff it because it's kind of a commentary over it, a funny overlay, you know, like any art these days. Yes. Well, and I think it's one of those things, too, that some movies can be riffed successfully. And it's not necessarily whether they're good or bad. Sometimes bad movies can't be saved with riffing. Um, But like. (laughs) Oh, totally. Totally. Yeah. Like, for example, um, we've never riffed it, but you know, the movie Marty. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. So good. But like, yeah. it, it's so funny. My family just, we t- we riff it while we go through because he keeps saying things to her. Like, I, out of the blue, Marty says to the girl who, you know, the kind of homely girl he's dancing with, he's uh, he goes, dogs like us, we ain't the dogs people say we are. It's like, yeah. she never said a word about being a dog. <laughs> Not one word. <laughs> so, you know, but th- you can just talk through that whole movie because there's so many fun things, but it would never ruin that movie. I mean, it yeah. might ruin it, but it wouldn't mean that I didn't love it. Oh, sure. It's a, it's a great movie. But yeah, you're right. There's a lot in it to uh, <laughs> to riff on. Well, and I love the Wizard of Oz one. I haven't seen the Casablanca one, but I keep thinking lately that I should check it out, believe it or not. I've been thinking about it because it, it is like one of my favorite movies. And I keep wondering, what did they do with that? Yes, yes, um, it's funny. But there are so many, you know, kind of, I don't want to say like hard boiled, but there's so many little, you know, catchphrases and expressions and things there that, you know, are, are interesting and they work really well in the movie, but I can see how they could be like, you know, <laughs> made into fodder. Yeah, absolutely, um, yes. Yeah. Yes. 
And the way when it, when Strasser dies at the end and he gets shot and then his face, it just looks Ugh. as he kind of melts down. It just looks, it's so funny. Anyway. Yeah. I know what you mean. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm going to check out the rift tracks now. So okay. I decided on that. Okay. okay so um, <laughs> I can now, take your payment right now if you would like. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, what's funny with that. My, my, I, I, my wife saw that with me, like maybe, a, I don't know, a year ago or something. And um, she's watched with me a number of times. That's like one of the few movies at this point that I can like watch over and over and over again. And like, there's there's points that she like just weeps every time. And she like yes. always feels bad when Peter Lorre, when they've got him and he's like, Rick, help me, Rick. Yes. Like that part. And it's like all these other little moments. Um, but anyway, yeah. Okay, so now with Riff Tracks, things you're doing right now, you do like a, a one, like every month where you're kind of like riffing some of these like old, like almost like educational type films, right? Um, you do that with yeah, Mary Jo some, Peel. Like, well, uh, Mary Jo Peel and I, um, friends forever and um, uh, riffing partners for about four years and we were, you know, where we've doing this. Um, yeah, we do movies too. Um, we've got like one we're going to be recording on Wednesday is called Junior Prom and it's from the 40s and it's like a bebop. Everyone's like, keep the beat, re-beat, a pee beep You know, they're doing all that and talking really fast to each other and uh, like a 40s, you know, zoot suit kind of a thing. So we're doing that. And then um, some spring uh, fashion type shorts from the um, 60s. One is called Match Your Mood and it's about how your clothing and um, decor can match your refrigerator. Or maybe the yeah. refrigerator can match what you're wearing. But at either at any rate, there's zebra <laughs> women in zebra outfits, and their refrigerators look like zebras too. So, from Westinghouse, wow. Westinghouse, there was I think it was this woman named Betty. F no, that's Betty. That's the feminist author, um, <laughs> Betty Friedan. Um, she did not was not a model for Westinghouse. <laughs> Yes, I, I think it's Betty the refrigerator Friedan. <laughs> no, it was Betty Furness, and she okay. was like a beautiful uh, woman that you know swung around with her skirts and sold appliances. Anyway, I think Betty Friedan is the one who referred to uh, kitchens as uh, um, um, comf comfy, comfy concentration camps or something like that, or the home of domestic women. Oh, that's anyway, funny. Uh, so yeah, she wouldn't be a very good refrigerator model, uh, unless they were like doing something like ironic for the uh, the new generation of hipsters right. that like that kind of thing. Okay, so <laughs> oh, okay, one more thing. There's a Rift Tracks Kickstarter right now, and it ends March 24th. Yes, it does, and there's still right? time to contribute to kick to stretch goals, and there's prizes, and go on the website um, or go on a Kickstarter, and you can read all the details. But it's amazing because every year. We do this, and every year the amazing Rift Tracks fans contribute. We get to do these super cool movies like this their year. I say we, but it's the guys. Um, Crow, and also Space Mutiny, which was a huge mystery science theater favorite. It was the one with like Blast Hard Cheese and <laughs> Chunk Hard Rock, and they, you know, this guy with all these names, and they're gonna re riff it, and it's gonna be super fun. So it, um, we reached the goal really quickly and now is all the fun stretch goals. So people, if you want to just have some fun and contribute, that would be great. Now, are, are we going to have brand new names like Biff Hardcheese, like kind of action hero type names? I don't know. Or, or is that is that going to be part of the, the riff? I has not seen or ear has not heard what the guys have for us. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm pretty excited at the possibility of, of, of new too. ones. But I don't know what and, they're going to uh, do. Yeah, and that's a great uh, mystery science theater episode. That was, I mean, that was very rich uh, uh, terrain for uh, for for, for uh, making oh. fun of. And and crawl um, is a movie I tried to watch once and I, I couldn't finish it. But I think with the riffs, that might change. Yeah, I've never <laughs> so seen I'm, it, so I'm looking forward to that one. Yeah, it was kind of it's like it was kind of one of those movies like Legend or whatever, like with Tim Curry and Tom Cruise. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know, a little more like in space or something. Anyway, it was weird. Legend but, um, in space. Okay. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's a good way to say it. Legend in space. Yeah. Okay, so so those are all awesome things uh, that yes. people should check out. Um, and uh, now we'll move on to discussing The Night of the Hunter. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned, it's uh, directed by Charles Lawton. It was his only time directing. I know. He's more, more well known as an actor. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, man, one of my favorite uh, Lawton movies where, where he's acting is uh, Island of Lost Souls. And that's one I, I want to do sometime on the podcast. But oh. uh, he's, like, wonderful in that. And crazy and awesome and uh, that so was good. kind of like yeah he's fantastic and he did a fantastic job here this movie is i mean 
so amazing to watch. And I guess I understand why it wasn't very successful at the time it came out, like in 1955, because it's it's kind of like a fever dream, you know? And It's terrifying, um, too. It is. I mean, and not just terrifying in what happens in the way that it's acted, just like just the way everything's put together and the, the set design and the lighting and the use of shadow. And, you know, he kind of famously... Uh, I think before he directed this, because he hadn't directed anything before, like uh, rented out like all the uh, like every film that um, D.W. Griffith films and just uh-huh. like watched them like very very closely, <laughs> and he like was almost like his sort of film school. Like, I never directed before, but I'm just going to really closely so watch just every watched D.W. Birth of a Nation and just went. Yeah, and just and so he like sort of tried to take cues from Griffith because you know for all the problems that Birth of a Nation has as far as its message, it's. Uh, you know, it was land, like a landmark film as far as the style mm-hmm. um, and the way that you know Hollywood movies were made, and you can see that in the film in a number of places in um, Night of the Hunter. But I, I, what I kind of stuck out to me is if you've watched any like German expressionist films from like the 1920s, like yes, uh, um, there's hu- like a huge influence there that I really haven't seen in a lot of Hollywood movies, especially. Oh yeah, movies totally. From this time. It's t- I always say the name wrong, but the cabinet of Dr. Caligari or Caligari, yep. I don't know which way you go. Caligari. But um, yes, all of the like um, pointy, the light goes up pointy and the angles and uh, it just gives you that off feeling uh, like it's a dream. It's real, but you may not, is it real? Can I get out of the here? Very claustrophobic. It's it's so good. Yeah, well, especially like the shots where, like in the bedroom, where he's there with um his you know his new wife, <laughs> um, and it's like you have like these, I mean, huge like, you know, like almost like flying buttress kind of like angles. Yes, and stuff. Oh, totally. It looks like it looks like a church. But we should tell people who maybe have never seen it to tell them the little synopsis. Okay. Yeah. Let's do that. Okay. So um. Well, first of all, let me start real quickly just by, by, by uh, saying who's in it and then um, the names, and then we'll sort of move from there. So Robert Mitchum plays the character of Harry Powell, who's mm-hmm. also called Preacher, uh, especially in, in the book, which I, I read because I thought the movie was so interesting. Shelley Winters plays Willa Harper, a widow. Uh, and by the way, Preacher is, we'll get into this, but Preacher is, uh, is insane. But um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lillian Is he Gish- insane or is he he's evil? Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure. And uh, we'll get into that, though. So... Okay. Um, Lillian Gish plays the character of Rachel Cooper. Lillian Gish, of course, from the uh, D.W. Griffith films, famously. And then there's um, the young children of um, Willow the Harper, youngins. the widow. The youngins. Uh, John and Pearl Harper. So, oh, there's also a, a, a brief appearance by Peter Graves as their father. Yes. Uh, whom, whom I always connect with the beginning of the end uh, in the Mystery Science Theater. Yes, uh, man found it. out too late, wasn't it? Isn't that, isn't it, it, the man's a living creature or something like that? Anyway, oh, yes. That. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of their uh, "Twas Beauty Killed the Beast." Yes, yes. Uh, it was famously to um, uh, Crow wrote a screenplay about Peter Graves called um, "Peter Graves at the University of Minnesota." Yes, <laughs> with the gripping title. <laughs> yeah, trying, yes, he was trying to sell it, wasn't he? Around the same time, he was trying to sell Earth versus Soup. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and uh, what I always remember, um, and it was sort of a the fact that Peter Graves was like the TCM host at the time, who would like yes. introduce all the movies. So anytime he'd come on screen, I think it was Crow who would say, "I'm Peter Graves." I'm Peter Graves. Yes. <laughs> so okay, so th- those are the characters: Preacher, Willa Harper, Rachel Cooper, and then the youngins, John and Pearl. So the basic synopsis here is that uh, Harry Powell is this like self-appointed itinerant preacher. And he is like going from place to place murdering widows. Yes, it's he's kind of kind of an interesting hobby. Well, and and apparently there, this is somehow like I don't know how much truth it is based in, but this is actually based on a, a real life character, oh. uh, believe it or not, which is kind of interesting. I want to Wasn't figure out. Really? More that. Oh, that's so creepy. Yeah. So he winds up in jail for car theft. They don't for get him the, for, yes. for killing widows. Yeah, and, yeah. and they give him thirty days only for grand theft. Thirty days. That's it for stealing a car. <laughs> yeah, and I think at the time that they arrest him, he's he's thinking about uh, killing a burlesque dancer. <laughs> so um, yeah. something's kind of averted there. Uh, yeah, but, uh, yeah, because he says he hates things. That, that he's sure that the Lord hates things, soft things, perfumey things, curly things, curly haired <laughs> like, things. Would you hate Harpo Marx? Like what is it? <laughs> <laughs> that made me laugh. It's so creepy. Yeah. 
Yep. Okay. So, uh, well, and actually the line there, and it's, it's, it's kind of interesting in the book because it's done a little bit differently, but uh, the line there when he's thinking about killing this burlesque dancer in the book, it's a prostitute. It's like, he always like waits for, he thinks that God will tell him, you know, like yes. when he's supposed to kill somebody. Yes. And so like, he's about to do it. He's reaching for his knife or whatever. And, uh, and he thinks that God tells him, Oh, well, never mind those people. You can't kill a whole world. And it's like, <laughs> there's too many of them. Yes. Um, which I thought, I don't know, that line sticks out to me. You can't kill a whole world. You can't kill um, the whole world, right. Yeah, no, um, he's, he's pure, purely evil. Anyway, okay. Yeah, so he's in jail for car theft, and he meets a man, uh, Peter Greaves, who's about to be uh, hanged for killing two other men while robbing a bank, uh, I guess bank mm -hmm. tellers or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so and he gets stealing the idea $10,000. Yes, yes, he, yes. He, he's he's stolen this money and nobody knows where it is. And uh, the preacher gets the idea that the man's two children know where he hid the money. And he decides since this guy's about to be hanged anyway, um, he's going to go and marry his widow and eventually he's going to find the loot. Right. So, some spoilers here. And we're going to have to get into this somewhat. So I'm just going to, you know. Oh, are you not, not supposed to give spoilers on this? Because you know, I'm, I'm sorry, going to, right. because we, okay. we have to. I, yeah, all we right. can't talk it without giving spoilers. And this is like all in the first half. I'm not actually going to just give away anything about the last half of the movie in this synopsis. So okay, all, this good. is all in the first half. So he marries this woman. She thinks he's this you know wonderful man of God or whatever, and so does everybody else. But eventually she overhears him asking these kids where the money is, which he told her, Oh well, you know, um, um, uh, what's the, what's the guy's name? Brother something or other. Uh, the guy, the the husband, brother told, Harper, brother Harper, or whatever. Yeah, he he threw it in the bottom of a lake or the river, and so that's what he's told her. But then she hears him asking the, the kids where the money is and threatening them. Yes. So she becomes wise, and he of course murders her. And <laughs> yes, he does. But can I bring something up that I just yeah. love in the in the jail cell? So. So he steals a car and he's in for 30 days, but they put him in with a guy who's going to be hanged, which, you know, I don't know what kind of prison this was, but anyway, they, um, and then at one point, <clears throat> um, Robert Mitchum is um, hanging over the, cause he's got the top bunk and the murderer guy is Peter Graves in the bottom bunk and, and um, Robert Mitchum like hangs down to talk to him. And then Peter Graves punches him in the face and he punches him out of his bunk. He goes flying out of his bunk. It's really awesome. It's great, and and I think you know it's so early in the movie that you don't really get to enjoy it <laughs> like as much as you should. Like if you if that would be that would be great at the end of the movie if he just gets socked. Yes, and once you you hate him so much, but it is kind of fun because he punches him right in his butt chin, right in Robert. <laughs> he's got such. Does he not have the biggest butt? He so needs chinderwear. He so needs to cover up yeah. his obscene uh, chin. Anyway. Yeah, that's a great moment. Yeah, I know. And he does. He does have a, quite the chin. He does. Um, and he falls yeah, so, up. He just like it's it's worth the price of admission to see that. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's a pretty good fall. OK, so the, the kids like so he corners these kids and it's like he's like cornered them in the basement. He's got like this knife and they like get away and they take a boat down river and he's tracking them along the way. So that's like the first half of the movie. That's right, that's what happens. Right, and so. Right. He's going to get them eventually is kind of the idea. Right. And they're they like, swore oh, to their daddy that they would never, ever, ever tell where the money is. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the daddy, you know, the dad makes, you know, John in particular swear that he's not going to tell. And he just like carries it around like this terrible burden. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, pretty psychologically damaging. Yeah. Um, so that's this kind of starting point here. And. Like we talked about like the, you know, the way that it looked a little bit. And I talked about kind of the German expressionist look and that kind of thing. But this is, I mean, an amazing film to watch just aesthetically. Mm -hmm. what, did, what did you think as far as that was concerned? Well, it's it's beautiful. In fact, my um, our one of our kids, our sons, George, um, he was t he likes German expressionism. And he was just kind of watching it on his own one night and stopped it and um said you have to come here and see this shot this shot is so beautiful and it's um the one where they first set out on the river and the stars mm -hmm. are up high and the and the water's just taking them down and it's very quiet it's it's just beautiful just that still shot you could just take a picture of it. it's beautiful but that's gorgeous and then it also starts out really cool with um a plane like they gets these these great aerial shots mm -hmm. which he did not need to do. I mean, the money and everything that he spent on that and just kind of showing the landscape from the, from uh, 
you know, from, from the, from the air, it's really, that's really well done too. So it starts out great is not like any other movie. So I can see why people didn't like it. Yeah. But I'm mean, watching it now. I mean, I think maybe with hindsight, it's, uh, I mean, it's amazing to watch. And, mm -hmm. and it's like a lot of these outdoor scenes, I mean, as far as I can tell that they're like, in a lot of cases they're using sets and, and that like is, pretty consistent with the way like German expressionism mm -hmm. kind of films would work because it was not really about creating something that looked real to life. It was about creating a mood and a feel. Yes, and so yes. a lot of these outdoor scenes where they are, you know, supposedly outdoor scenes where they use these sets, just the way the stars look and the way the sky looks, it's, it's so like really kind of eerie and unearthly. Yeah. It's beautiful, but it's, it's like unearthly. It's eerie. Um, yes. So there's that. And, and there's like all kinds of other little visual things, like these little cues and hints about things. So like, that hit him with the knife, the tattoo. He's got these tattoos on his uh, on his knuckles. One one hand says love, the other one says hate, and that's like been a trope in you know all kinds of like bad movies where somebody's in prison for at least a few minutes, uh, right. where somebody has that tattoo. Yeah, and actually Spike Lee used it too in um uh oh gosh what is that one movie ah oh, not she's got to have it do the right thing uh, yeah. the one guy uh, does Radio Rakim have it maybe yes yes he's got brass knuckles that say it. Yeah, and then yeah. he punches Mookie or Tuki or what's that guy's name? Anyway. Uh, Mookie is Spike Lee's character, but there's yes. um uh, I can't think of the uh, the name of the doesn't he he tries to like strangle the uh, the uh, uh, the guy who owns the pizza shop whose name I yes, can't remember. Yes, yes, yes. So yeah, so that that shows up in a lot of things. So there's like the knife, there's the tattoos, there's this audio cue as well, which is like anytime he's about to do something like totally terrible, he sings like very slowly, leaning on the everlasting arms. The old I hammer. know. Which and, um, is so upsetting because I love that hymn. And one day, this king got taken away by some bad men. And before he got took off, he told the son to kill anyone who tried to steal his gold. And before long, the bad men came back and... Just a man. Good night, Pearl. Sleep tight and don't let the bed bugs bite. Good night, Miss Denny. Don't let the bed bugs bite. Yeah, and it's J J Alan Jackson sings it the best if you ever want oh, to really? good. So good. Okay, um, I'll check that out. He's the man's a living legend. I love Alan Jackson. But anyway, um uh it it's it's yeah, he sings his song and then he does evil things. It's really, really creepy. And and you know what? This might be a good time, maybe, uh, to talk a little bit about like who this character is supposed to be. Like what yeah, please he do. Is, is evil or or insane. Mm-hmm. Because, like, there's a certain degree of self-awareness that he has, right? You know, he knows enough to lie. Mm -hmm. He knows enough to, like, misrepresent himself. And he pretends to be something that he's not. Right. And yet, he seems to think that God is telling him to do these terrible things. At right. least some of them. Like, he thinks that God is telling him to kill these widows. Right. I get like maybe more a sense of this in the book um, mm -hmm. that he has like suffered some kind of sexual trauma because the way that he treats sexuality yeah. is, is I mean, pretty bizarre. So like he, and there's even a line where he's like praying to God or something. And he says that he doesn't think God minds the killings, um, but he doesn't like all the, the curly headed things and the perfumed things and that kind of thing. So that, yes, yes, yes. He, yeah, he thinks, yeah, he's a, the classic woman hater. Um, and um, I mean, I don't know how else you can slice that up, forgive the use of that word, but uh, that's, he just hates women. He hates attractive women. Yeah, in particular. Well, and so, okay, in the scene where he marries the widow. He marries Shelly Winters, yeah. He marries Shelly Winters, and they, you know, are on their honeymoon in this hotel, and she comes out of the bathroom and has a nice robot, although in the book she's nude. Mm -hmm. And he, like, gives her this big, shaming speech about you know do you think i was going to come pawing at you and that kind of thing like right right and he like sort of puts her in front of a mirror 
and like he sort of shames her and says, you know, this body's not made for 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 lust. It's made for you know having Everybody. babies. Yeah, no, it's yeah. so cruel because she. Um, it's just so cruel because it's her wedding night, and he's yeah. acting like she's um, wanting to do something that she should be ashamed of, and she's already has trepidation about it, and she's already has is a zero self esteem person, as Shelley Winters plays so well yeah. and uh, always so well, um, and so it is. It's so frightening, but the time nineteen fifty five. What's in a way, it's even more creepy because they don't go to the violent extremes that a movie of today would go to and so you're left to imagine that the trauma that he probably had or what happened to him and then they don't show what they would show in a movie now which ends up actually being more terrifying and ends up where someone like me watches the movie where i would never watch the new version of this movie mm -hmm. it would just be too awful for me to even i just wouldn't watch it well, yeah, and you know the, the two things that about that scene that are different in the book that stand out interestingly to me. Um, one thing is her sort of inner monologue, where mm -hmm. she's before she comes out and she's thinking to herself, you know, I don't have you know a lot to offer, but the one thing I do have is my body. Right, and, and I am her, married. We are married. Yeah. That's what. But, but it's like this one thing that she's trying to give him. Right. And like this little piece of self esteem that she has. You know, she's like, you know, I, you know, I don't have much, but I have a body, and it's beautiful, and whatever. And he just sort of shames her and shoots her down. Oh, it's and awful. Then, but then after that, when they go to bed. Uh, well, he, she, lied. he goes, I was praying. I mean, he does the worst kind of religious abuse that you can do is to shame someone by using religion or or the Bible. He That's all he does is, oh, it's just so cruel because she wants to be made clean. She wants to. She realizes she was a kind of a selfish person in the past anyway. Well, particularly about the money, I think, and, mm -hmm. and that's maybe more pronounced in the book, that the money, it's in the movie too, but the money is the sort of source of shame because she she wants it, mm -hmm. uh, but it like has sort of infected everything. You know, it's infected her family, it's 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 destroyed her family, and you know, she sort the of The love of money it. has destroyed their family, yes. Yeah, so so yeah, there's a lot of shame, but after all this happens and they're, they're you know, asleep or whatever, the, the film cuts there, but in the book, she hears him weeping next to her really? after all that. Yeah. And they don't get into any particular background or anything about what happened to this guy, but there's like, you know, obviously something going on, some sort of sexual trauma that he's like, has sort of, he's sort of acting out against it, like with violence. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is pretty, I mean, I, and it's, you know, you can only like try to speculate, but it, it does add sort of a, you know, this extra dimension to the character that you don't really get in the movie because in the movie it's like, well, he's crazy or evil or both, but they really don't have any reason to feel sorry for him at all. But like, no, this no. And Cody, I absolutely do think that he is not crazy in the least. He is really? evil. See, in my mind, he's too rational to be, to be crazy. Everything he does makes perfect sense. If you're evil. And that, that could be now, so what what I will say though is you have this element here of, and I think we've all kind of met people like this maybe, uh, who justify their own bigotry or, or or hates or hatred or whatever on the basis of some Bible verse they picked up here or there. Right, right. And that at the very least seems to be happening that he has this perception in his head about the way the world is mm -hmm. and about what has to be done with it that at the very least he's put into the mouth of God. You know. Uh, he, he's he's perceiving that God is 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 in agreement with him on this, and that in fact God is leading him and directing him. Right, right. Which um, he is he's wrong. He is not. Yeah. Well, and, and, and in particular, and it's interesting because there is that trope of the you know the 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 hateful, bigoted you know religious zealot who shames people for their sexuality or whatever. But what's interesting to me is that when you're when you're reading through the Bible, um, sexual sins are actually treated with, I think, the most amount of grace compared to other kinds of sins. Yes, um, it's true. Like, yes. but, but not yeah. murder, not sexual murder sins. <laughs> well, not, yeah, well, it's really yeah, it's murder and not like harming right. children. You know right. what I mean? You know, Absolutely. Jesus has the whole thing about, you know, you better have, you'd rather, you'd rather, it'd be better for you to be thrown into a river with a millstone on your neck than to, to harm a child. Yeah, or um, harm one of these others. Yes. Uh, absolutely. I mean, because this sexual sin is what got, you know, uh, with my, with, um, uh, excuse me, um, on the roof, 
David, King David. Mm -hmm. I mean, and he was the man, as we all know, he was man after God's own heart. And yet that sexual sin and lust is what brought him down. And it, it caused, a, it's, but he, he didn't rescind his promises to Israel because it, it exactly. And he didn't take anything away. Sure. Yeah. I think uh, I would agree. And Rahab, and Rahab, Rahab comes to mind too. In the yep. Old Testament, the, the only, the only uh, uh, person in Jericho who's saved is a prostitute. Right. So, right. I mean, sexual sin, I think, is treated with a great deal of grace. But Yeah, you know, the woman with five had... husbands, we don't really know if it was sexual sin or what was going on there. But some sort of sex was happening <laughs> to have five husbands. So, yeah. Yeah, it's I mean, and and it's always the Pharisees, for example, who are you know, does he know who he's eating with? Does he know what kind of woman this is? Um, right. Jesus doesn't mind. No, <laughs> you know, uh, so that's interesting to me too. That yeah, people have this tendency to make uh, the Bible into how you know whatever fits in with their own history of trauma or their own biases or whatever. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that's that's an interesting element, but it becomes this this sort of source of religious hypocrisy, which I think is one of the big themes in the movie. Um, there's sort of an opening um, quote where, uh, um, uh, what's her name? Lillian. Um, uh, well, yeah, Lillian Gish, uh, Rachel Cooper is the character where she is reading to the children from scripture and says, you know, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inside are ravening wolves. Um, right. Ready yeah. to devour. Yeah. So. Beware yeah, of false so prophets. Yes. In sheep's clothing. And then she talks about the good tree bearing good fruit no good tree, no no bad tree can bear good fruit. No good tree can bear bad fruit. And um, the other, I think what's uh, interesting is she's the only one uh, that reads scripture, and mm -hmm. then it, and it informs her her the things she says and the things she does. Everyone else, no one else reads scripture. The preacher carries his Bible around, but he never reads from it, and. Um, they're all the ones that are uh, spewing all the religious stuff and um, and talking about God all the time. And yet they're all the, the they're the hypocrites and they're also the evil ones. And then the, the icy, what's her, her name? Icy Spoon. Yeah. She's just, to me, well, we have to introduce that character, but um, it's just interesting. But the one, the one woman who actually reads scripture is the only one that doesn't really bandy it about unless she's instructing the kids. Yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah, and, okay. So, so yeah, quickly we, we should get into the spoons. So, the, the spoons own this ice cream shop that Willa, uh, or the char a character played by Shelley Winters, uh, she works at. Mm -hmm. And Icy is this kind of actually, I think in in, in the uh, in the book, um, Rachel Cooper refers to her as one of those Duck River Baptists who's probably a Republican. Oh, well, that's uh, funny. That's how she describes her. That's but, hilarious. Um, um, but yeah, so she's this zealous woman who's encouraging Willa to get remarried. And when this preacher comes into town, oh, he's a man of God. If he's, if he's interested in you, you should, you know, grab him right now. Kind of oh, thing. yeah. She's really that woman. Like, you don't have much. So if a kind of a, this good looking guy likes you, you should just go for him. Don't be stupid. Yeah. That's kind well, of her. That's yeah. basically what she says. And she has some great lines in the movie, including like some that kind of shocked me. Um, for like the time period that we're talking oh, about a movie yeah. made in 1955 um <laughs> she refers to the sex act as um you know well you know mostly i just i lay there and think about my canning um <laughs> yes and, yeah she did and then and then um she they go to her husband and he kind of gets this like um you know like pulls his at his tie basically like uh, ah well uh <laughs> that's very funny yeah so 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 those are the spoons you know i see is this kind of person who's I think sort of easily duped by this notion you know somebody claims to be something then that's what they are so she holds this sort of sacred I guess mm -hmm. uh this notion of the man of God we get into Rachel uh, Cooper who's played by Lillian Gish who uh, was sort of a major actress in the D.W. Griffith films and it, it's not an, an accident that she was selected to, to play this part considering Lawton was so uh, influenced by watching Griffith's films before well, he made right. this. And, and she also, um, you know, she was the ultimate uh, young, sweet, innocent thing in, in the silent era. And I think it's interesting that then he would pick her to kind of be the leader of the children. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and, and her whole thing is, but you know, eventually they get down river and find her and she's, it's like a depression year. She's taking in all these, you know, kids who are running around, you know, without mm -hmm. parents. And, you know, raising them up and taking care of them. And she 
reads reads him reads him reads them from the Bible every night. She has, I think, a, a you know, a very deep and abiding concern for uh, for for children and um, uh, you know, little things. As I think is the the phrase that she uses. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Little things, yeah. something like that. And yeah. which you know is just another way of of the saying. The world is harsh uh, for little know. things. Yeah, it's a hard, it's it's a hard world for little things. Yeah, and um, which is just kind of another way of saying you know like. Uh, what Jesus talked about, you know, the whole, the first will be last. And there's a sort of, it's a very much a gospel oriented approach, but it contradicts this idea uh, of the spoons, for example, that, well, you know, uh, we trust the man who's in authority. And so there's this sort of very Do they? opposing. I, I think she does, but I think Mr. Spoon is just a nebbish. He doesn't, he doesn't trust oh, sure. him, but he doesn't have enough integrity well, I, I to say anything. Yeah. Yeah. I see at least, I think I see has this sort of approach of that's I think a little bit more institutionalized. What Rachel's kind of doing is, is focusing more on the little things, uh, you know, and so there's this very much a reverse kind of approach of, of how they see the gospel and how they see the world. Yes. How this whole thing affects John in particular, because, because his little sister Pearl is pretty young. She's like four, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, how does this affect the way John thinks about God? Because there's this man who's supposed to be the man of God and he's cruel. John from the beginning doesn't trust him because he makes up this lie about the, 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 the money being thrown in the river and John knows that he's he's full of it. Right. Um, and so it's basically like adults like this guy, but no kid likes this guy. Well, I, his sister takes a shine to him, but she's too young to know any better. You know, mm -hmm. she sees him, I think, as like another dad. Yes, and um, she's supposed to love him. Yeah, she's yeah. someone, yeah, love him, but she doesn't really, yeah, that's true. She loves her brother more though. Yeah. She yes. listens to him. Exactly. Well, and so, but the, there's these, this way that this whole thing sort of shapes the way John thinks about, uh, about God. Um, so, oh, so real quickly, um, the way John remembers the police coming and arresting and beating his dad, yeah. um, he thinks of them as, he calls them the blue men. Oh. Uh, and so in the book, there's all these references to, you know, in his sort of inner monologue of the blue men. And, so there's this like scene where he's watching a uh, um, preacher and, and uh, he says, he's thinking to himself, well, my mom says he's a man of God. So God is one of them. God is a blue man. Oh, wow. So he thinks of, you know, God as this sort of cruel authority figure, this sort of mm -hmm. authoritarian um, because of the way preacher has represented God. Wow. To him. Okay. Wow. Okay. And, um, and like a little bit later in the book, as he's sort of like, you know, struggling with how he's supposed to respond to this guy because this guy's supposed to be this authority figure. He's supposed to, you know, listen to and do what he says. Uh, and so he decides, this is a quote, so I will be God and then I won't be so scared of him. That's um, what John says? That's what John says to himself, that he uh -huh. sort of is going to cr make up his own rules or whatever so that way he doesn't have to be afraid of what God's going to do to him because, once again, God is a blue man. Wow. Um, well, but he, in the movie, they don't really go there. At all, they don't really. But but you have to imagine that something's happening with him, and you get a hint of it a little bit because he's he starts to treat preacher with a great deal of skepticism. But then he meets Rachel, and uh, yes, and I might say that. Let me throw this in. So if yeah. if indeed he did say that in the book that I'll be I'll do this and then I will be God, mm -hmm. right? Is that what he said? Someone he says like I'll that? be God, then I won't be scared of him. Um, is that's what we all do when we are. Yeah take our lives into our own hands and kind of our fist up at God, I'll do it my way. I mean, anytime we are in any kind of, I think all of us, when we are away from God are being our own gods, going our own way. And all, all, all of us have turned away. And, and um, the bad guy, Robert Mitchum at one point says, um, they asked, someone asked him, what kind of a preacher are you? What kind of a religion do you, I uh, do you have? And he says, I've got a re the religion that the almighty and I made up betwixt us. Yeah. So that's exactly what he's doing is he's just making up his own way because yeah. then you don't have to be wrong. You don't have to sin. You don't have to have consequences. Yeah. It, but, 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 it, but in the case of John, I think there's something that I, I mean, I agree with you. I think that that's what we all do. But in the case of John, I think it starts from a place that you can, you can uh, sort of understand because he's given this perception of who God is. That's so mm -hmm. not God. Right. And, and so, you know, but that does change with Rachel. I mean, in, in particular, he starts hearing these Bible stories. Right. And, you know, first he stays standoffish. She's reading from the Bible and he goes and stands outside. Yeah, he walks right outside. Yeah, yeah. I've had enough of that kind of. 
Yeah. And so then she he starts to hear these stories and they sound awful familiar. They're about, you know, this 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 young boy uh, who is you know pulled out of a river, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> taken care of. Mm-hmm. And he he sees himself in the story. He sees himself in the story of Moses. And then they start talking about uh, Jesus and his family having to flee. Yes. And he sees himself there as well. Right. And suddenly God, you know, the gospel seems different to him. It's not, it's no longer about these sort of authoritarian figures. who. He's the God who saves. He's the God who saves. Well, and it's, 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 he's the God who identifies with the weak things, Mm -hmm. the Mm -hmm. little things, Mm -hmm. you know, know, he's, he's the God who's a baby uh, who's being hunted. Right. Right. And, 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 you know, what's interesting too is, um, you know, this kind of idea of hypocrisy, because there's, a different kind of hypocrisy that Rachel represents that, that and I don't, you don't, I don't even want to call it hypocrisy, but, you know, preacher is like this hateful man who pretends to be loving. Mm-hmm. Whereas Rachel is this very kind woman who pretends to be a lot harder than she is. Um, and, and that's kind of an interesting dichotomy that they're both sort of pretending to be something else. And, you know, uh, but I think it's, it, they're both coming from a place of maybe being hurt where she pretends to be harder than she is because she's been hurt. Mm-hmm. Whereas he pretends to be kind when he's really cruel because whatever has happened to him has turned him that way. And there, uh, yeah. there are these but kind it, of two different ways to react to that. Um, I would say though, that her, uh, her authority that she has is she's a gracious stern authority over these kids. And, mm-hmm. and that might be why she does that where the other guy, you know, he has, he's an authoritarian and it, they don't respect him at all. And that isn't real authority at all. He's just a huge bully and, yeah. a, and, a, and a murderer, but yeah, they do. Yeah. But I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's, yes, I know what you mean where she wasn't just this kind hearted uh, little old lady, but mm-hmm. doesn't it kind of seem like that would have been what you would have been at that time too? You with kids, people weren't as um, you're a little rougher with kids, even when you really love them. Yeah, sure. Well, th- I think it, th- it starts when she gets the kids and she's trying to give them to take a bath, and John won't listen, and she like takes them around and starts switching them. Yeah. She so just, she kind of yeah. So she's yeah. this disciplinarian, but it's coming from a different place, and John I think picks up on it pretty quickly. It's the that. first, yes, it's the first real authority that he's known that you can trust yeah. and you can relax into it. That that it's the first real authority that gives freedom, which is true authority, gives freedom. But even even when she's spanking him, though, I mean, that's the thing. Right. Even when she's disciplining him, right. there's a sense of peace that he has there. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and I think this is an interesting little element in the book um, that when he knows that Hunter's coming back that night and she's on the porch there with the shotgun, um, it says that he sleeps and it's like he just he, he he trusts so much. Oh yeah, he's asleep in the movie. He's asleep yeah. at her feet. Yeah, and which you know, despite all the all the you know the danger and fear, he's able to simply just trust her. Uh-huh. Uh, but do you know what, uh, Cody? He falls asleep in the boat when he first gets the first time they run away from yeah. Robert Mitchum. Which it's come on, the guy had a name, but it's basically Robert Mitchum is chasing them because he's terrifying. <laughs> anyway, um, the second they get in the boat, he falls asleep. Yeah. I don't know if you noticed that. I did, yeah. I, I think in the book they just talk about how he just has, I think he's maybe so worn out from the ordeal or whatever. Whereas I think, at least, I mean, you know, the book and the movie are a little different. And sometimes you can read in different things. When I guess I should have read them. the book. Well, well, I don't want to talk too much about the book, but I think it informs some elements. But sure. in, in in the book, he, he, does, um, it does, he does talk about how he goes right to sleep knowing the hunter's out there uh, just because he trusts her so much. That's really um, nice. Yeah, that's beautiful. And, and and I think that, you know, she represents, I think, a much more faithful vision of God than Preacher does. That I even should in, hope so. Yeah. But, that, but that, that even in even in that um that situation that feels right. very dangerous, yes. there can be trust. Oh, totally, yes. Yeah. Uh yeah, so um she pretends to be harder, I think, than she is at times, but um you recall uh, what was the name of the uh, the older girl? Um Ruby. Yeah. So so Ruby is uh, you know, going out supposedly for sewing lessons and mm-hmm. meeting you know, shacking up with boys and I've been with men. Yeah, yeah, I've been with men. Um and she is like very comforting about it, you know, because Ruby I think is feeling, you know, shameful about it. She's sorrowful about it. And she's not uh, Rachel doesn't like shame her about it. 
She no, doesn't. totally not at all. She does. You're right. She doesn't. She just says, yep. Okay. Almost as if like, okay, you confessed it. And now I'm not even going to remember it. It's as far as East is from West. All yeah. right. Yep. It's great. So yeah. There's, I think, yeah, Rachel presents, I think, so much a better picture of God. But And I think, too, I love that this movie has Rachel because I feel like in old Hollywood, there was this maybe fear of um, if you present just a negative religious figure, mm -hmm. that it's going to come off as anti-religious right. um, and that you'll just have this negative stereotype stand in for all religious people. So they would try to have some sort of a counterbalance. And... I love that she's here because I kind of feel like in a lot of contemporary Hollywood movies, she just wouldn't be there. You would just have preacher. And oh, if there absolutely. is a Rachel at all. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Cause she says like, for example, with Ruby, she says, you know, you were looking for love in the, in the only foolish way you knew how. So mm -hmm. she's showing this just real wisdom about uh, why a person would be, you know, she's just basically going out and guys are buying her ice cream and then she's making out with them. And you know what I mean? She's just doing mm -hmm. that to get, stuff and she wants to do that with the preacher and so mm -hmm. she would have given the chance you know what i mean but she doesn't get the chance and so yeah i agree with you like that that they're showing that her that she's um wise in the world she's sly as a fox rachel knows about the world but she's mm -hmm. gentle as a dove and they do not make fun of actual biblical uh uh, I don't want to say they just don't make fun of real religion. They don't make fun of a real Christian, which is what she is. So you just yeah. wonder what Charles Lawton was was thinking. But it's kind of amazing that they don't make fun of it of her. It's it's not well, playing I, for I, any I, kind yeah. of cynicism. They don't. They're not. Uh, she's not secretly bad. She is just purely good. But like you said, but it's not like this complete opposite, like all good, because she's got a little. She's a little bit saucy. She whips the kid because he does a bad thing. She's, you know, she's a real. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I kind of feel like if, if, if this film was remade, and maybe I'm wrong, but, or a film like this was made now, if, if there was a Rachel character at all, I have a suspicion that Rachel would be at least an implied agnostic that, Yes. They, you know, oh, yeah. uh, yes. Of course. No, she would be. Um, she would be a citizen or a a, um, a realist, and she just knows that um, we have to help each other. It would be the highest good. Yeah, and, and so yeah. But whereas in this film, I mean, her her who she is and what she does is rooted in her Christian faith. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, I, but and and I think this whole. The I mean, whole she pulls point, a gun on him. She's got a she gun does. on the guy. And then, did you notice? like twice in the movie. So she shoots at him and then he does this wallop like, um, like demons are coming out of him. He does that twice in the movie. Oh he yeah. That right, right. That scream, scream. Yeah. Yeah. Which he's like that, hollering, hooting or whatever. Hooping. Yes. Hooping? Yeah. yeah. He's whooping or yeah. Hooping and a hollering, but it's, uh, it's very eerie and it isn't him. It's very unearthly or un. Okay. And, and did you notice this? She's standing, she's sitting on the porch with the gun. And I love the way they shoot this because you see him, then you see her, and then the camera pans over and you see that she's like on her, like almost like right behind her. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, and he's like in this, he's outside and it almost looks like a garden scene where he's like the serpent in the garden. Yes. Oh, yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. I did notice yeah, that. It's amazing. So it's yeah, super I cool. And then he screams <laughs> like he um, is found out, you know, like he's being mocked which the devil hates to be mocked. And that's kind of the way he is. And then he does that once John does something to him when he first doesn't get him, when he's going after John in the boat and then he can't get him. He just kind of howls at the moon. Yeah. 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 He's, he's interesting when he, when he just sort of loses it. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, yeah. but, but that scene where, you know, cause he, he sort of, okay. So he comes to try to get John and Pearl cause he finds out he gets information about the whole thing. Uh, that, that he's she's taken in these these two kids and he finds Ruby and she says oh yeah their names are John and Pearl so he comes pretends to be their long lost daddy mm -hmm. and Rachel already doesn't believe it because John had said something to hit her about her parent his parents being dead yeah and there's so all these little signals for her that he, this guy's not who he says he is no because he tries to do his like shtick have I let me tell you the story of love and hate H A T E is house Cain slain and he goes into that and she just basically does the yeah like uh yeah whatever okay let's get on with it she doesn't even allow him to go into his sales pitch that usually uh kind of bewitches everyone else you know she just kind of yeah she just shuts yeah, him yeah. down but then did you notice when he leaves them then um 
when she's got the gun on him and then he howls, then he says, um, the Lord God will, I wrote it down because I thought it was amazing. The Lord God will guide my hand in vengeance. And then he says, I'll be back when it's dark. So yeah. scary. And the, yeah, it's good. Uh, and I think, and I wrote this down just because I like the quote. I think it's right around this time, like in her inner monologue when he's talking, uh, she says to herself, how many fools has that devil tricked with his lying mealy mouth gospel and his prayers and his hymn singing? I know. <laughs> um, so, but she, yeah, so she's on to him right away. And, um, but, but they, okay. So that scene though, at night when he comes back yeah. and he's just sitting on a stump and she's sitting on the porch with her shotgun mm -hmm. and he's singing, leaning on the everlasting arms. Yeah. And she joins. What a fellowship. What a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness. What a peace is mine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting. Yes. And and it's like this beautiful, like the, the, the most vivid illustration of that sort of point counterpoint. You know, yes. he's the religious zealot who's a, who's a hypocrite and mm -hmm. she is the real thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, man, it's it's just that that the scene is anytime I've like talked to people about that movie, say, have you seen this movie? They'll say no. And I say, well, you got to watch this scene. I mean, it's just, so, right. And then um, what's cool. Uh, so they're singing it, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. And then she starts saying, Jesus, Jesus, lean on Jesus, lean on Jesus, lean on Jesus. Mm -hmm. He never, ever says the name Jesus hmm. ever. And she, she does. So she sings, she doesn't sing this second lyric or the second, what do you call it? Verse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She, uh, she doesn't sing with him. She sings Jesus leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus. Yeah. So she um, takes it back. I think is what she's doing in a way to me. I saw that as uh, yes. I kind of like Judas, you know, like, yeah, you did all the stuff with the other apostles. Yep. 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 But in the end you're different and she hmm. takes it back. I thought. Yeah. Yeah she's reclaiming the faith in a way, right? Yes, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it looks a lot, It unfortunately, it looks the same to a lot of people from the outside. Yeah. Did you have any other notes about specific things you wanted to, to address that sort of stood out to you in the film? Because you, you had a lot of, picked up a lot of things I actually missed. Um, well, here's my, uh, like my, I'm in high school thing that I noticed. Uh, I noticed that there's always a light on at their house. The gas light outside's always on. And I just thought that was hope, perhaps, if I were writing in my high school paper, um, mm. that the light maybe was just hope, because why was that gas light on all the time in that creepy old house? That's interesting. Well, so the only I'm, thing. Yeah, I'm the only light. To, yeah, and uh, th th there might be a, a symbol there. I I'm trying to think. I feel like in the book there was something about how. They had to, the gas company ran a line through their property and the way that they, you know, they'd say, well, if you let us run a line through your property, we'll put a gas light in front of your house. Oh, really? Oh, isn't that yeah. interesting? Because I didn't notice that it was just all on. Okay. I guess I would say the, um, this kind of little thing, like what if I write down here um, uh, of things that I kind of noticed? Oh, um, uh, first of all, when he first shows up and it's just his scary shadow and it looks like the Quaker Oats man is coming to get them. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's just like that. And then she, the little girls, how cute with a voice. She's always talking like that. She's adorable. I love oh, yeah. that. And um, uh, I think, now this is just me, but this is like my women's intuition, I think, on this. I think that the guy who directed uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, who was it? Mm -hmm. That guy's name. I can't remember. Um, Oh, mm -hmm. rats. I can't remember. Maybe you can figure and find out. I think he pulled heavily because that was in 62. This was 55. 
Mm. I feel like he pulled heavily from their relationship, Pearl and John's relationship for Jem and, um, and Scout. And Scout. Or, yeah. It doesn't it just feel like a, a uh, kind of the beginning of that relationship, like that, like a first run at that. And then uh, To Kill a Mockingbird is better. It's more richly drawn between the brother and sister. But that I think he must have been influenced by that. Even for that whole movie, I thought was influenced by by this. It's 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 so funny that you mentioned To Kill a Mockingbird because like when I first watched this, I was describing it to somebody. I said it was kind of like To Kill a Mockingbird on acid. Yeah, um, right, right. But yeah, there, there there is definitely some similar things going on. And uh, the director was uh, Robert Mulligan for To Kill a Mockingbird. Robert Mulligan. Yep, I feel like he. I bet he was a fan. I bet if you asked him, he would say I, that he admired that movie. Yeah, you think he might. So that's yeah. all I kept noticing. Um, also, was that it, he does look like the Quaker Oats man is chasing them at some points uh, with his little tie. Otherwise, like a '80s corporate woman with her little bow tie, I think. Um, and then it's super gross when they go and they're begging, and that depression lady just gives them both a potato that they just start eating a cold potato. Mm -hmm. So gross. Thinking a little bit more about the Cole Mockingbird thing because you yeah. mentioned it. My brain's turning now. Um, yep, yep, yep. So there are a lot of interesting similarities. So there's, you know, Gregory Peck is guarding the, uh, the jailhouse with the shotgun. Mm -hmm. um, there, it's, it is a coming of age kind of thing, right? Because these kids have to grow up very fast in the face of what they're sort of seeing and happening in the, in the world around them. Right. Uh, yeah. And, and, and there's, I mean, there's sort of a kind of a darkness that's happening. I mean, to kill mockingbird has this sort of eerie, something's happening in the background, but you can't quite put your finger on it. Um, Mm -hmm. And there's even kind of like a boogeyman. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, and, and that hypocrisy things. and all that. I mean, they are similar. They're yeah. they're similar movies, but 1962 was a different time. Kind of ready for that darker stuff. 55. I mean, I don't know what other movies were out. You had well, you had Marty that year, which was <laughs> best picture. Um, yeah. I don't know. I just think uh, I'm sure that other people were really highly influenced by it, and it was not a financial success at all which is i guess charles lawton was he didn't live very much longer after that yeah well it was, it was the only thing they, they gave him a chance to direct and, well and i think speaking of the influence of it um i kept thinking did you ever read the stand or watch the miniseries of stephen king no i didn't okay the miniseries is hokey but it's worth watching the one from the it, 80s uh i was think it was like 92 or something oh, right, around, okay. right around there yeah um it's hokey in spots but the miniseries is worth watching and, and the book is really darn good too um but the uh there's like the the mother abigail uh character who's like the you know the the leader of the good ones <laughs> the good people uh -huh. in this sort of post-apocalyptic world and then there's randall flag who's like a stand-in for satan and oh. i kind of saw like a rachel cooper and preacher kind of thing going on there and i and i remember thinking man you know randall flag really i really kind of see like you know this robert mitchum kind of character in him and um and I actually just on a whim kind of Googled it and I saw where Stephen King had like put together this list of like his top 10 uh, like movie villains and like villains in literature and stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he, um, he listed preacher as like in the top 10. Yeah. Oh, he is. Um, I think Pauline Kale said something about this movie about it's, it's um, there's some funny stuff in it. Cause there is, but aside from it is one of the most horrifying movies ever. It's, it's a true horror story because there's kids involved and, Anybody just chasing kids. It's it's everyone, every kid's greatest fear that a scary guy would come and get you. And he's never fast. He's always slowly coming mm -hmm. after you. And he even sings the song scary. slow. He sings the song slowly even. <laughs> he sings the song so slowly. It's so, yeah. such, if, if, if people want to see a scary movie, uh, this is a scary movie. This is the only kind of scary movie that I like because it's, it's suspense. There's no actual gore in it. Yeah. Although... The scene of Shelley Winters in the Model T underwater oh, wow. is terrifying. Man, it is, and it, I mean that that was like I like was paused it, looked at my wife, and I was like, "Are you, are you watching this?" Like I was, I was a little shocked about it. And it was it, shocking. And if you look, you can see kind of the mark, the line where he supposedly slit her throat, and then there's that line like Uncle Bertie, who you know this kind of you know sea dog character, Drunk. he finds the body. Yeah, and talking about it like to himself later uh and or to his dead wife one of the two and he's, he has this comment about how like it was like she had a second mouth 
Yeah, and that was like, super. Yeah, I re I noted that too. That's super creepy. And it's uh, yeah, I mean the film is so graphic and so in so many ways that like surprise you. Yep. Um, without yep. being you know super you know explicitly graphic, I guess, but um, but yeah, um, and and I I think you know another area where maybe uh, you're talking about the kind of the psychological aspects of you know like what what happened to preacher kind of thing there's another thing in the in the book which is what was the the effect of this on john mm -hmm. and um that isn't really detailed in the movie like you maybe could get a sense of it a little bit but in the book after all this happens he basically loses his memory of everything that happened before he got to rachel's and oh, so wow. when he's like a, yeah, when he's like on the stand. So he has to go to uh, therapy in the movie in his and they're, 30s, obviously. Oh yeah, okay, that's <laughs> what that's all about. I see. Yeah, he's on the stand. They tell him to point out the man or whatever. In the book, it's like every time he tries to look at him, it gets fuzzy. He can't even see him. Oh, that's um, so crazy because that seems. When was the book written? Um, right, the same year. They they like got on this. 55. It was nineteen fifty five. I mean, it's interesting because like the end of the the line, I like, wrote it down. The last a book uh, line in the movie is she says, you know, with the little children, they abide and they endure. And I suppose at the time, you know, people used to always say that kids are resilient. They they forget, but I think we know we know better now. Mm -hmm. I mean, they forget for a while, so you can grow up and you can do stuff. But uh, it'll come looking for you. Yeah. Well, and it's and, and, and like in, in the in the book, it's like um, they'll like ask him questions about things that happen on the stand, and he'll say, "I'll remember one thing, but then I forget everything else." And it's like he'll, little pieces come back oh, to him. Oh, that oh, isn't that the way it is though? When bad things happen to you, trauma. I mean, yeah. I don't know if, what um, your childhood was like, but yeah. Uh, yeah, you just you don't remember everything at once. But um, hey, here's another fun thing I I know I I noticed. Okay. Here's another high school. Um, writing my high school paper that I noticed yeah. at night, everything that they show is an unclean thing. It's owl. It's a hmm. rabbit. It's a toad and something else. And they're all unclean. Hmm. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And then um, you're from Cincinnati, right? Yeah. Doesn't he call that a den of perdition? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think your first is, uh, he, he says something about how, cause he's, he's telling the story that his wife ran off the kids and he's trying to find them. <laughs> And they said, well, where do you think she went off to? And he says something like, well, probably Cincinnati or one of those Sodoms on the Ohio River. Yeah, those dens of perdition. <laughs> <laughs> it's you that lives there, Cody. But you know. yeah, I, it's a great movie. People should definitely uh, watch it. And it's a scary one. If you're, it's yeah. better than okay, Psycho. Okay, so it, it is. And you know, um, so my, my wife actually loves horror movies. And, um, but... Like I'll show her things like this, thinking, "Oh, well, she likes horror movies and stuff. She'll like this." And like I think I tend to show her things that are a lot more disturbing than she would watch on her own, but that uh -huh. I wouldn't necessarily think of as a horror movie. Yeah, <laughs> like, oh my gosh, that's so true. Me too. Me too. Yeah. I don't think of. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, um, but yeah, I haven't we, seen a scary movie since. Um, um, I can't even tell you the last scary movie. I think I saw Silence of the Lambs, and that was the last of my oh, wow. scary movie. Ninety three, I think, right? Uh huh. That that uh, would yes, I I, I don't like to be uh, scared like that. Yeah, I can't get well, it out of my brain. So I, I so when we were dating, I showed up my wife Raven, um, um, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf. Uh huh. When it was over, she looked over at me with like tears in her eyes and said, "Why would you show me that?" <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's, that's really funny. Well, yeah. I think Mike and I've watched that like four hundred times. That we just, I don't know, it makes us laugh. Our kids, yeah. our kids will stop when they were really young too. I don't oh, know man. why. It's great. Oh, oh, and the uh, oh, okay, and it, mystery science theater connection. Uh, uh, Gamera. There's a uh, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf sketch with in one of the Gamera movies. Oh, right, right. That was when we were heavily in. That was a heavy rotation for all of us on MST watching that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, was, I think I think Turner Movie Classics started showing it. Yeah, we all watched it one weekend and then wrote that sketch. Yeah, I, I think like the, 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 glass in the in the isn't there like the sound of drinks being poured throughout through the whole thing? Sounds right. Yeah, I think I think the line though is um uh is, is a, it's who's afraid of Gamera Turtle instead of who's afraid of Virginia. Oh, Wolf. that's very funny. And, oh, and um and it was something like oh you, you remember seeing the movie um uh, Gamera is holding his drink. And uh, he turns and says, ah, <laughs> something like oh, that. Oh, yes. Oh, no. Um, um, 
Yes, is in the house that Joseph Cotton put him up in. Yes, I know the scene that we're doing. Yes, is when she's. That's very funny. I'm going to say one short thing real quick, if that's okay, and then then I'm, then I'm going to do the the conclusion. Is that okay? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, I talked about the idea of, so like there's these stories of Moses and the bulrushes we talked about mm -hmm. and uh, Rachel's reading and then the, the Christ story and how John, they sort of, he, he sort of like puts himself in those stories. And at the end, and this is in the movie too, but uh, it's a little bit longer in the book, just a little bit. So quote is Rachel reflected about children. One would think the world might be ashamed to name such a day for one of them and then go on the same old way. Christmas made Rachel angry. It made her think again of what the world does to children. If one listened well upon any night in history, one might hear the running of their feet, the little children for whom there was no welcome door. Old Rachel banged pots and baking pans in her kitchen those bustling days before the Yule season, muttering to herself and scowling out her windows, angry at how it was with some child somewhere in the world that very winter day. Oh. But there's this deep connection to, you know, Christ here that, you know, the, this movie ends on Christmas because it's about a little child who's yes. hunted. Yes. And, um, and yeah. that God explicitly identifies with this little child who's hunted. Yes. By, and by becoming. Cares, and yeah. cares, uh, cares about him and her as an individual. Yes. That's, that's, I'm going to read the book. Um, yeah, you should. It's that, weird. It's great. And because then she asks him about, um, she starts to talk about that story and, she, and he says, what happened? And he, they fled, they fled. Jesus and Mary and Joseph, they fled. So um, yeah, that's really um such a unique way to think about that and such a, a beautiful way to that that she's angry about Christmas and yet reverent of it at the same time. It's a very uh it's kind of like our walk, you know, it's just where we we're stuck here. Wow. Okay, so <laughs> Bridget, thank you. In so conclusion, much yes. Yes. It, 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 um so you've got uh, riff tracks uh, releasing but just about every month with Mary Jo Peel. Yep, with my dear friend Mary Jo Peel, exactly. And, and you've got one coming up soon, the spring collection. Uh, yep, it will be um, something called um, um, a mama match your mood, which is about ma ma matching your clothes to your refrigerator. And um, then it's um, spring something where it's about um, all the men's fashions for 1962. And then a little thing where some college boys rate girls on their outfits. So very and so, fun. And it's, so in the spring collection is not an anthology about Coily the Spring Sprite. It is not about Coily the Spring Sprite, but it should be out sometime this spring. We have to record it on um, Wednesday if there isn't a blizzard. Oh, and and we've got so that's you can find all that at rifftracks.com r i f f t r a x yep and the Kickstarter uh, if people want to get in on it and get the rewards that ends March twenty fourth yeah you guys are doing Space Mutiny and Crawl in uh, theaters nationwide yeah. in uh, June and in August the guys I won't be there but this is Kevin Murphy um, Bill Corbett and my husband Mike Nelson they'll be live in six hundred theaters across the United States both in June and in August riffing this funny movie through fathom events and it's such a fun way i guarantee you you will laugh more than you want laugh at any comedy movie at a riff tracks live event three wow. or four laughs per minute guaranteed yes <laughs> okay anybody wants to learn about that search uh riff tracks live 2018 kickstarter on google and it'll, it'll take you right there it'll take you right there uh, right? And mary joe and i's riffs are guaranteed two laughs per minute but you know well, that's not as high, but it's still pretty good. Well, because we, we have to talk, but we talk a little more. Anyway, thank you, Cody, for having me. This is always so much fun. Thank you, Richard.